Good morning. Good morning, Living Word Church. I hope everyone's enjoying the, uh, the nice weather, the unseasonably nice weather. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Please join us in singing Holy is the Lord. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day and how the weather is nice outside so we can uh, worship you. And please help the money that people are bringing in and may it be used for your glory. In your name, amen. It is the same today for a few of the people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace, his undeserved kindness in choosing them. And since it is through God's kindness, then it is not by their good works. For in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. So this is the situation. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they are looking for so earnestly. If you have, the ones God has chosen, but the hearts of the rest were hardened. Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. Oof. That was pretty bad. Happy Sabbath. Much better, much better. Hope you had a blessed week. Some of you have. Well, that's good. Um, <laughs> it's always a challenge for me to uh, preach a message. Because I try not to, as much as I possibly can, to uh, regurgitate, re-present a message that I presented uh, before, whether it was here or somewhere else. Um, I, I always try to, I shouldn't say always, but I, for the most part, I try to uh, put myself in a position to let God speak to me in a way uh, to deliver a message that is timely, that is, that is directed to myself first and foremost, but also to you all. Uh, it's difficult because if I don't have an a, 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 a intimate relationship with you, I don't know where you are spiritually. So I have to trust in God to give me that wisdom, give me that understanding to deliver a message that, will, that should be applicable to all of us, wherever we are in our spiritual journey. So with that said, the um, message for today is, I titled it, Designed to Fail. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for the privilege, the honor to call you Father, but to come to you at this time to receive mercy and grace for this time of need. Who are we to come before you? But if it wasn't for the fact that Christ himself, who suffered, who endured, who overcame, and gave us the opportunity, opened the door wide open for us to come boldly before your throne, do we have this? So humbly I ask, Lord, let your spirit fall. Fall in such a way that all of us may experience it and be changed. Speak, Lord, for your servants hear it. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you guys, but um, I, I, I like design. I'm not a designer. I'm not an, an artist, per se. Uh, but... One of the things I like to do as a, as a child, is like most kids, they like to draw, they like to paint, they like to do uh, doodling and stuff like that. And I, I guess I had somewhat of a talent. I never fully developed it because uh, I never was like that. I don't think, in my opinion, I thought that was that good. Uh, so I played around a little bit, right? But still to this day, I enjoy it. I enjoy viewing pictures, paintings uh, back in New York. Obviously, we had lots of uh, museums, so there's always uh, plenty to, to go and appreciate. But I'm going to ask you guys a question, and I want you to think about it before you answer. Okay? You guys ready? If you are presented a challenge, pretty much insurmountable, what would you rather have? A hero that could overcome any obstacle 
or a mission that could not fail. Let's put it in two other terms. Would you rather have a superhero? Iron Man, Superman, the Hulk, Spider-Man. Who seems to uh, overcome any obstacle. They don't care. They don't come up with a plan. They just allow their abilities to dictate how they're going to overcome those challenges. They rely upon themselves. Or would you rather have no major hero, no guy with a supernatural talent, but a, a plan, a plan that could not fail? What would you rather have? How many people would say they would trust more in a superhero guiding them and giving them the victory versus measly old little man, yourself, myself, but a plan that could not fail? You'd rather have the plan? How many people would rather have the plan? How many people would rather have the superhero? All right, that's cool. Well, many of us would rather have a superhero. Have that person do all the things and we just follow and we're just like, hey, no problem. Hey, we got the victory because of that person, right? Many of us don't trust ourselves enough to say, give me a plan and I'm going to succeed because the plan cannot fail. We have doubts in ourselves. We don't trust. But then there are instances that we do trust ourselves. Maybe too much. So in this passage, in Romans chapter 11, verses 5 through 7, Paul is describing an instance, or pretty much the history of Israel. There, they were given an opportunity, and they failed. But it didn't say God, you know, Paul says, like, wait, 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 even though they failed, God did not abandon them. The opportunity was still there for them. They failed, but the opportunity was still there. But there's a key verse there. In verse 5, he says there's still what? A remnant. There's a group. Even within the group that largely failed, there was still a large group, or a significant group, within that large group that still was able to succeed. How? How were they able to do that? Well, the sermon today is pretty much going to explain it. So if you bear with me, we're going to do a, a lot of scripture reading. Amen? Amen? And we're also going to do a lot of spirit of prophecy reading. Amen? Amen. Uh, a little reluctance on that last one. But we'll have fun, I promise. So, would help if I turned on. Does anybody recognize this? You know that's where this is? This is the new Narita Airport in Japan, in Tokyo, Japan. This is the international terminal. And they, they're going to have the Olympics in 2020. Okay? And they redesigned the whole uh, airport to look like a racetrack. So as you go through the airport, you kind of know which direction you're going. Right? It's really interesting. Because the signs are minimal, or at least not as uh, overly crowded as we are used to seeing. They're very distinct. They're very clear. And it basically tells you where you need to go. Pretty clear, yes? It was completed back in 2015, so five years ahead of schedule before the, uh, the world is going to Japan in the uh, next three years, or in 2020, I should say. Even if you don't know how to get out, pretty much lays it out for you. Literally lays it out for you. Now this airport here is Atlanta, uh, Hartsfield-Jackson Airport. This is the international terminal in Atlanta. And they pretty much uh, did the same thing, although this airport was completed um, three years prior in 2012. And as you can tell, there is a lot of design in this airport, you know. And even the ticket terminals, the ticket uh, counters, are angled in a certain way 
to guide the people into the direction where they need to go. So it's not typical like you go to an airport and you don't see things like this normally. Okay? These airports are now designed with people, the end user, in mind. Now why do they do this? Because obviously airports are extremely busy. Can anyone guess what the busiest airport in the world is? JFK, that's a good guess, but no. O'Hare, good guess, but no. London Heathrow, good guess, but no. One more. Atlanta. 98 million people travel to Atlanta, Hartsfield Airport every single year. Heathrow is 88, is number two. JFK is, I think, top five. So uh, you can see that the designer put a lot of intent in this because, obviously, 100 million people travel through this airport every single year. And because of this design, it helps people to know where they are going in a timely way. Any of you guys who've traveled, you guys know that it's difficult sometimes. Sometimes we run late to the airport and we have to kind of navigate the airport in a quickly, quick ma manner to be able to get to our destination or get to the, the gate uh, so that we can catch our flight. Even so, look at this. This is what a sketch design prior to them uh, creating this building. You can see they have a, actually uh, a yellow brick road leading them towards security. So as the, the ticket gate or the ticket uh, uh, counter is angled in that same direction, the, you can see the lines are actually naturally pulling the people in the direction where they need to go. There's no signs. Everything is visual. Now, this type of uh, interior design, this type of graphic design, is not, it's relatively new. It, it was pretty much uh, uh, incorporated uh, back in 2008. And it's called wayfinding, where designers create interior designs to help people get to a specific destination without signage, typical signage. It naturally pulls people in the direction where they need to go. Now, based upon this, I'm going to give this, this Bible study slash sermon to help us to understand something distinct, something powerful in Scripture. A couple weeks ago, last week and the last two weeks before, or a week before that, Pastor Om preached upon the topic of the, the parable of the prodigal son. How many people were here for that? You guys remember the sermon? What was last week's message about? Put you on the spot. Was it the prodigal son he was focusing on? Who? The oldest, the oldest son. What about it? What about the oldest son? What? Why? Why? You're right. Why? Okay. He didn't know he was lost. Why? Why didn't he know he was lost? He was at home. He felt he was safe, right? He was within the confines of the, of the, the family structure, the family building, and he thought he was okay, right? Two weeks prior to that, the sermon was focusing on who? The prodigal son, yes? What was the problem with the prodigal son? He was lost as well? Why was he lost? Come on, you guys know the story. What did the prodigal son do? He asked the father to give him his inheritance. Why? So he can go and live, lavish, live a lavish lifestyle. I want the money, the money give it to me, I'm going to go, right? And basically, you know the story. He spent all his money, he got hungry, he was starving, and then he came to his senses and he went back home, yes? Did he want to become a son automatically when he went back home? No. What did he want? He wanted to be a servant. Why? He didn't feel worthy and? He didn't think the father would take him back and? He's like, man, my servant's back home got it better than what I have now. 
This condition where I'm in right now is not good. I don't want to be in this condition. I'd rather be in that condition. So, hey, you know what? My father might not take me back as a son, but maybe he'll take me back as a servant. That condition will at least be better than where I am right now. Yes? Yes? There's two major problems in that story that are not 100% uh, expressed, but they're there. And I'm going to use that as the backbone for our message today. Many of us, we look at the life of Jesus, and we look at him, and we say, man, Jesus is our Savior. We love him. He's an, he's an incredible redeemer. What he did, I could never do. But, you know, we never focus enough on the humanity, the human side of, of Christ. Christ was fully man and fully God. And we take it for granted, if you will, that he was fully human. So I want to show you a passage. Well, this is you know, one of the, actually the designer for the uh, Atlanta airport. Nobody says, ultimately, if we do our job well as interior designers, wayfinding enhances the customer experience without them knowing why or how. So in other words, the design, it basically tells them where to do, how to, how to go, without them actually realizing that they're going in the right direction. But they do end up where? In the right location. So notice here, Desire of Ages, page 147. The words, mine hour has not yet come, point to the fact that every act, how many acts? Every act of Christ's life on earth was a, in fulfillment of the plan that had existed when? Come on now, from the days of eternity. Before he came to earth, the plan laid out before him, perfect in its details, but as he walked among men, what happened? He was guided step by step by who? He did not, look, what's that next word there? Hesitate to act at the appointed time with the same submission he waited until? What is Ellen White saying in this passage here? How many of you guys read this passage before? Jesus, although he knew the plan ahead of time, he did not go ahead of the plan and say, oh, I want to do this because I know the plan. Yes? Did he? No. What did he wait for? He waited for the Father to say, okay now, okay now, okay now. It doesn't even get, end there. Notice what happens here. Manuscript releases. Christ in his life on earth made how many plans? No plans for himself. He accepted God's plan for him. And day by day, the Father did what? Unfolded his plans. So should who? We depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. As we commit our ways to him, he will direct our steps. She goes on to say, too many in planning for a brilliant future make an what? What's an utter failure? Total disaster. The parallel is those who build their house upon a rock versus those who build their, build their house where? If you look at the passage, Jesus says when the, when the floods came, when the storm came, those who build their house on the sand, it was complete annihilation. Complete destruction. That's the word I was talking about. Utter failure. Let God plan for you as a little child. Trust to the guidance of him who will keep the feet of his saints. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9. God never leads his children. Otherwise, they would be what? Choose to be led. If they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. God's never going to obligate you to go along with his plan. It has to be a cooperation. It has to be you who willingly say, I submit to your will. Now I said to you, there's two problems in the parable of the, the prodigal son. One, both, both sons did not trust the father. First son, the youngest, hey, give me what belongs to me because when you die, I don't believe I'm going to get it. Second son, I don't trust the father. Hey, 
I've been working for you all this time, and you've never given me an animal that I could sacrifice with my friends. I'm working and working and working to get something because I don't trust that you're going to give it to me. Both sons didn't trust the father. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. So in this, look at the, in this story, or in this, this uh, depiction here of, of Jesus' life, Jesus said, look, if I'm going to be successful, I'm paraphrasing, I have to do it how? How? Come on now. By his father's will. He didn't rely upon his knowledge that he knew what the plan was. He allowed the father to unravel the plan before him day by day, day by day, every single day. But what about you? Do you trust in the Father on opening up his will for your life day by day? Do you trust the Father to unravel his plan for you every day? By that statement, you should automatically be putting yourselves either in the first son or the second son. If you don't trust the father, you're going to be in either of those positions. And the result is going to be what? Utter failure. Why do we come to church merely just to come together and sing a few songs and listen to a message and then turn around and leave and not be changed? Not make an impact? What's the point? See, just like I'm showing you in these pictures, I believe that this is what the church is. The plan is the same from the very beginning. Jesus fulfilled the plan, but we, by its same method, incorporate that plan into our lives so that the masses, when they see us, they know where they need to go. By your life being a testimony, being guided by the Father, who is the designer, who lays out the natural design for your life and mine, as he did for Jesus, those who don't know where to go can now see where they can go. But it doesn't happen by, by, by miracle or by accident. It has to happen how? It has to be in cooperation with the Father's will. It's his plan. So I asked the question, would you rather have the hero fulfill the plan and just follow along, or would you have a master plan that cannot fail? God's giving you one. Now, I'm not doing, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not, doing, I'm not watering down that Christ is God. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm trying to focus on is that even though Christ was God, he did not use that for his advantage in his humanity. In other words, it was his humanity that dictated how he was to live. Surrendering to the Father's will day by day. And by that same pattern, we ought to live. As we commit our ways to him, he will direct our steps. Now, I'm going to show you what utter failure looks like in Scripture. You guys ready? Yes or no? You're not ready. Do you want to see utter failure in Scripture, yes or no? Okay. Let's go to Genesis. First book of the Bible, if you're not familiar. Genesis, we're going to read chapter 
<clears throat> Chapter 18. This is a passage that we are very, very, very familiar with. This is the passage where Jesus and two angels go and visit Abraham. And Abraham is told at the ripe age of 99 that the very next year he's going to be what? He's going to be a father because his wife, Sarah, was known to have a son. Yes? Now, at the very end of this chapter, we know this. Many of us have heard the story, read the story, seen the story, heard sermons about the story, where as the Jesus and the two angels are leaving, they're headed to in which direction? Where are they headed? Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. And Abraham is kind of perplexed. So let's pick up the story. Genesis chapter 18. <clears throat> We'll pick it up at verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm, what I'm doing? Since Abraham shall surely become what? Shall become what? A great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, and that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So at this point, you know, Abraham is kind of like hearing this, and he makes a presumption. He says, wait a minute, are you going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Now, up until this point, there was no relationship that he had with God that, re that God revealed to him that he was a destroyer. There was no revelation of that. But somehow he came to this conclusion that God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So notice what he says. Verse 23, And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous in the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for 50 righteous that were in it? Now, you know it. What does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? If there's 50, I will spare. I will not destroy. He comes back and says, wait, what if there's 45? What does Jesus say? I will spare. What if there's 40? What if there's 30? Come on. Wake up. Notice there's 30. What if there's 20? What if there's 10? Was Jesus lying? How do you know that Jesus would have spared the city if there was 10? Okay, he said it. It's easy for us to be able to take that assumption now, hundreds and thousands of years later. But at that moment, put yourself in that position. How do you know that he would have kept his word? Okay. Did Abraham trust God? Really? At that moment, did Abraham trust God? Yep, but did he trust him? Why? How do you know that he didn't? Hey. I'm not going to have a kid anytime soon. Sarah's like, you know what? Maybe it's Hagar that God wants to bring about a child. Why don't you take her as a wife? And hey, you know what? If she has a child, we will then fulfill God's will. Did they take it upon themselves? Did they trust upon themselves to fulfill God's will? Or did they allow God in his plans, his perfect plans, to do his bidding? Yes or no? What happened? They trusted themselves. And what was the result? We're living it today, aren't we? He didn't trust God. But in this passage, you know, many people, they look at it like, oh, he's interceding, he's interceding. Yeah, I know he's interceding. I know that. 
But there's something that disturbs me about this passage. Why? Let's go to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. We'll pick it up at verse 10. Now, if you guys don't know, Genesis is written in a chronological manner. It's, it's basically a historical account. Notice what we have here. Genesis 14, we'll pick it up at verse 10. Now, the valley of Siddim was full of the Aswad's pits, and the kings of Sodom and of Sodom and who? Who? Fled. Some fell there, and the remainder fled, fled, fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of? And all their provisions, and went their way. Verse 12. They also took who? Who was Abram's brother's son who dwelt where? And his goods and departed. Verse 13. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the terebinth trees in Mamre, the Aserite, Amorite trees of Mamre, I'm sorry, the Amorite, the brother of Eschol, and the brother of Aner, the, and they were allies with Abram. Now watch this, verse 14. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken what? Captive. What did he do? He armed 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went to pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobath, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back what? Or who? His brother Lot and his goods, and well as the women and the people. What did Abraham do? Did he hesitate? The moment he heard that his brother, notice what the, what the Bible says, his brother Lot was taken, he took how many people? 318 trained servants in his own household and says, come on, let's go. Without hesitation, was he successful? Was he successful? But let's go back to Genesis chapter 17. Sorry, 18, 18. Pick it up at verse 31. Then he said, indeed now I have spoken, I have taken it upon myself. Speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. And he said, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak what once more. Suppose should there be 10 found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. Verse 33. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. And Abraham did what? Abraham did what? Strange to me. Abraham had a feeling that Sodom and Gomorrah was, was to be destroyed. He knew his brother Lot was living there. And where did he go? 3 chapters earlier, the moment he heard that his brother was in trouble, was taken away. What did he do? Did Abraham trust God? No. Can you see what I'm talking about here? If he trusted God, wouldn't he have acted the same way that he did in in Genesis chapter 14? Come on, wake up. What do you what, what do you acted the same way? My brother is in the midst of a destruction, of a place where he's about to be destroyed. I need to go and what? Now, you may say, well, hey, you know, it, it, it's difficult. Well, let's see. How difficult could it have been? How many people did Abraham say 
were necessary before God said, I'm not going to destroy the place? How many? Wait a minute, hold on a second. How many people did he say, hey, if there are ten righteous, what, will, what did Jesus say he was going to do? Spare. Now, how easy or difficult would it have been for him to find ten? What do you think? Would it have been difficult for him to find ten in Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes? Who says yes? Who says no? One, two, three, four. Okay. Well, let's look at it. Genesis chapter 19. We know the two angels go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. They run into Lot. Lot says, hey, don't hang out in the square. You know, we're going to come in. And I want you to stay in my house. I'm gonna, you know, it's dangerous out there. I want you to live with me. Stay with me at the light. I'm going to take care of you, blah, 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 whatever. So notice what happens. Genesis chapter 19. <clears throat> we're going to take it up at verse 11. This is after the men of Sodom recognized that these two strange men, they wanted to, you know, sodomize the two strangers. And notice what Lot says. Verse 11. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they came weary trying to find a door. Verse 12. Then the men said to Lot, have you, this is the two angels, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law? Sons? Your daughters? And whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. Now, here's the thing. In that passage, it doesn't say exactly how many relatives Lot had. Does it? But what do we know for sure in the story? Those of you who know the story. Lot, his wife, two daughters. But what's the characteristic of the two daughters? They weren't married. They had not known, the, they had not known any man. He Lot says, hey, don't take, don't take these two men. Take these two daughters of mine who have never known a man. Yes? But I'm going to tell you there was more than four. Lot, his wife, his two virgin daughters. The angels revealed to Lot the object of their mission. Patriarch of Proverbs 159. We will destroy this place because of the city of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The strangers whom Lot had endeavored to protect now promised to protect him and to save all the members of his family who would flee with him from the wicked city. The mob had wearied themselves out and departed, and Lot went to warn his children. He went out to who? Warn who? But wait, where were the two children at the time that the people were knocking, looking to sodomize the men? Where were they? There were two inside the house. Why would he have to leave to warn the children if the children were inside the house? What is it implying? He must have had other children that were not living with him in the house. Notice what it says there. He went out to warn his children. He repeated the words of the angel. Up, oh, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed to them as one that mocked. They laughed at the, what they called his superstitious fears. His daughters were influenced by who? Oh. He had other daughters that were married that did not live in the house. Let's assume that he had two daughters because the word is plural. Just two. Now what do we have? Lot, his wife, two virgin daughters, two daughters that were married, and two husbands. How many do we have? How easy would it have been to find ten? I'm not saying that they're righteous. How many righteous people went into the ark? One. How many people were saved? Abraham took 318 to save his family that was captured, and he did not one thing to save a city which had his family living inside of it. Yo, get out. Get out. Would they have trusted him? Would they have respected him? 
He was the same one that had just left a couple years ago to go rescue them. Why wouldn't they trust him? But they didn't trust Lot. Why? Why didn't trust Lot? Look what it says. They were well enough off where they were. They could see no evidence of danger. Everything was just as it had been. They had great possessions, and they could not believe it possible that beautiful Sodom would be destroyed. Who does that sound like? You're not getting it. Two weeks, last week, we talked about it. Oldest son thought he was safe. Where? He trusted it. Hey, I got everything here, but I don't trust the father. He had everything at his disposal, but he didn't trust the father. Now, you'd say, well, we don't live in a place like Sodom because Sodom is so wicked. Really? Have you looked outside lately? So what's the point? If we know that the world is soon to be destroyed, we know it. It's going to happen. What are you doing to save your brother? Are you trusting in the Lord's plan for your life so that others may be led to the direction where they need to go? If you don't trust the Father... There's no way, no how that you'll be able to talk to your brother, talk to your relative, talk to your co-worker about the soon coming destruction. There's no way. Because we're living a lifestyle like, hey, I'm going to be here forever. I'm good. I got everything. There's no sense of urgency that there's soon going to happen a destruction. Come on, be honest. Are we really, really feeling the sense of urgency? Or are we Laodicean? Think we're rich? Think we can see? Think we're clothed? But the reality is that we are poor. Miserable, blind, naked. Nobody wants to admit it. We think that we're okay. We think that everything is right. But the world is dying before you, right before your eyes. I have a brother who left the church. I talk to him. I, I don't beat the Bible over his head or anything, but I talk to him. I'm like, hey, you know what? See all the things that are happening? The world's going crazy. You know, we got to start getting our act together. By God's grace, we got to get our act together. He says, yeah, yeah, you're right. But I don't push. I pray for him. But am I worried for him? Absolutely. That's my own flesh and blood. But what about those who are not my flesh and blood? Am I worried for them? My life will only tell. If I fully trust in God to unravel his plans for me, then I cannot hesitate. Now, notice the word hesitate I'm highlighting here. Because what happens in the story of Lot? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 19. <clears throat> Verse 14. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were married to his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed that you were joking. 15. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. Verse 16. And while he, while he, while he, while he hesitated, what happened? The men grabbed him by the hands, his wife, and the lands of his daughters, and the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside of the city. What did Lot do? Did he trust God? Did he trust God? Where did he get that from? Where did he get that from? Hmm. 
Lot returned sorrowfully to his home and told the story of failure. Then the angels bade him arise, take his wife and two daughters, who were yet in his house, and leave the city. But Lot delayed. Though daily distressed by beholding deeds of violence, he had no true conception of the debasing and abominable iniquity practiced in that vile city. He did not realize the terrible necessity of God's judgment to put a check on sin. Some of his children clung to Sodom, and his wife refused to depart without them. The thought of leaving those whom he had... He, he held dears on earth, see more than he could bear. It was hard, for, hard to forsake his luxurious home and all the wealth acquired by his, by what? By the labors of his whole life to go forth a destitute wanderer. Stupefied with sorrow, he what? Lingered and loathed to depart. Who does that sound like? If I don't have a sense of urgency... If I want to stay here, and don't tell me that you don't have this. Listen, I'm 48 years old, never married, no children, okay? And I know some of you are half my age, maybe even a third of my age. And I know what you're thinking. I hope Jesus doesn't come until I get married. I hope Jesus doesn't come until I finish school. I hope that Jesus comes until I go out there and make a little bit of money for myself and buy a few nice things. How do I know that that's true? Because I'm doing the same thing. I worked in Wall Street. I made lots of money. I spent lots of money. I did a lot of things. Look, all that money is gone. Well, oh. <laughs> I want the same thing. And I've been an Adventist my whole life. Well, I left the church and came back. But I knew it. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Daniel Revelation. Destruction. Fire and brimstone. We, yo, we've been hearing it forever. Ellen White's been dead 102 years. She's been dead 102 years. She was thought, hey, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And Jesus is not here yet. But there's no sense of urgency. We know it's coming. There's no sense of urgency. Why? Because we don't trust the Father. We don't trust Him. Be honest. If you trusted the Father, you would do what needs to be done. Now, I said there's two problems in the story of the, of the prodigal son. Second problem is this, proving my case. If the second son, the oldest son, trusted his father... What would he have done the moment the youngest son left the house? What would he have done? What, what, what? Woo! But what did he do? He stayed, continued working. Psh, to hell with him. When he comes back, he sees a party going on. Oh, what is this? This son of yours. He didn't even call him his brother. This son of yours who took what was yours and spent it lavishly with prostitutes. How did he know that? If he was working in the house. Maybe he wanted to do it. But he was afraid. So he pretended that he was really doing it because he, he wanted to do it. This son of yours who comes back and spends everything. Ugh. You didn't give me anything. I've been working for you all this time. Ugh. Why didn't he go after him? He knew what was going to happen. Because he said it. The moment he, came, he heard he came back, he was going to go out here. He's going to spend all his money. He's going to do... Just like Abraham. So I'm asking you the question. If you know destruction is coming, you know that living a worldly life leads nowhere but destruction. You know that the plan that's been laid out is following the plan that God has laid out through the life of Christ Jesus. Why are you in seeking your brother that is lost? Where are you? 
But Lot, confused and terrified, pleaded that he could not do as he required, lest some evil should overtake him. Listen carefully. And he should die. Living in that wicked city, in the midst of unbelief, his faith had grown dim. The prince of heaven was by his side, yet he pleaded his own life as though God, who had manifested such care and love for him, would not still preserve him. Did he trust God? Did he trust God? He should have trusted himself wholly to the divine messenger, giving his will and his life into the Lord's hands without a doubt or a question. But like so many others, he endeavored to plan for who? What did I say in, in, in manuscript releases? What did she say? Too many in planning a bright, bright, brilliant future make an utter failure. Let God plan for you. Trust in his guidance. Yes? But do we do this? Do you trust in God? Do you trust in God? Come on, man. Don't lie to me. I'm telling you, I don't trust in God like I should. I'm not there yet. There's no way, there's no way that I'm even there yet. But guess what? I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, man, play, pour out your spirit upon me because there's no way that I'm there. There's no way. So you don't tell me this, this, that you're there, that you trust in him. Without a doubt or a question. But like so many others, he endeavored to plan a future for himself. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? Who was he relying upon to save his own life? Himself. Was he trusting in God to save him? No. The oldest son, who was he trusting on to actually provide for himself? He wasn't trusting in the father to provide for him. I've been serving you and you didn't give me anything. I've been serving you and I've been giving, I haven't gotten anything. I've been serving you and I haven't gotten anything. Check your prayers. If you really trust in God, you're not going to be saying, hey, Lord, I'm a good Christian. Give me this. Help me heal this. Do this. Do that. Because then you're only focusing on yourself. But I guarantee you there's someone next to you friend, family, co-worker, whatever, who is in a more dire situation than you are because they have no idea that there's a destruction coming. And if your life is not reflecting a life of urgency, testifying that there's a coming destruction, if it's not doing that, then don't tell me that you trust in God. Don't tell me. Because your life is telling me you're a liar. This is the reason why God created this incredible design seen in the life of Jesus who gave himself completely for you and I, not for himself, for you and I, because there was no hope without him. No hope without him. And he says, I want you to do the same. Too much. It is, a, it is a most f fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on ordained ministers. It is by the spirit of power that the souls dead in trespasses and sins are quickened to hear the word of life. And the command to work unselfishly and earnestly rests upon every soul. All who are ordained unto the life of Christ. Woo, wait a minute. Back up. Does it say Pastor Ron? Does it say Pastor Ron? Does it say Pastor Travis? All who are ordained into the life of Christ are ordained to the work for the salvation for their fellow man. Whatever their work, whatever their business, their first interest should be to seek. Oh, shoot. Sorry, Mom. Their first interest should be to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And by precept and example, in word, in spirit, and action, Show their earnest zeal for Christ. The spirit and the bride say, come. And, and let him who hears say, come. And let him and the thirst and whoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Abraham, now check this out. Notice what she says. Abraham has now fully and nobly borne the test and by his faithfulness redeemed his lack of perfect trust in God. Do you know what she's making a comment on? Genesis 22, after he's willing to sacrifice his son. Then he redeemed his lack of perfect trust. 
from Genesis 13, when he meets Hagar in Egypt, to Genesis 22, he had no full trust in God. It wasn't until he was given the chance to sacrifice his own son that he realized that he trusted in God 100%. Which lack led him to take Hagar as his wife. After the exhibition of Abraham's faith and confidence, God renewed his promises to him. My challenge to you, do you trust God or do you not? Answer that for yourself. I don't need to know. Answer that for yourself. And if you don't, then you know what you need to do. Ask God, help you to put you in a path to understanding that this is what's right. This is what needs to be necessary. This is how it's, it's planned out to be. Seen in your life and mine. Last one. Today there is a multitude to be reached. The world is full of suffering and distress, of disease, of every stripe and type. There is a constant need of deep, Christ-like sympathy. This sympathy should be manifested at all times and in all places. God could have sent angels to work for man's reformation, but he did not do this. Humanity must work for humanity. God uses those who are willing to be used. The church is his instrumentality, and if the church had cherished a sense of her responsibility, fervent, earnest messengers would have carried the truth countries far and near, God's living word fellowship, SDA church in Bering Springs, would have preached in every corner of the earth. God's plan for you is to start to trust in him and his plan for your life because others' lives depend upon it. Millions of people are going through this planet without a sense of direction, without hope, without knowledge that there is a plan already laid out. And it's a simple plan. One sentence. Love God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. The plan cannot fail. Use the plan. Trust God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Then love your neighbor as yourself.